Thank you very much. My name is Lars and I'll introduce myself a bit more in a second. First I'd like to explain a bit about the motivation for this talk. Uh, it's about usually abbreviated uh, MVP, but I don't want you to confuse it with a minimal viable product, which is a great uh, buzzword these days. This is not a talk about that, it's about the model view percent pattern uh, applied to Angular. Uh, the concepts I'll describe for you are heavily inspired by the React community. They have been doing this stuff for the past three or four years, so we have some catching up to do. So let's get started. <clears throat> Never mind the four names at the top, just call, call me Lars or Lars Brink. Uh, I'm a 31-year-old native Dane, mostly, and I'm a computer scientist working as a front-end engineer at Frontmatic. At Frontmatic, we manufacture machines and equipment and develop control systems for the food industry and utilities as, and manufacturing as well. I prefer to call myself a front-end developer, even though usually I work on full-stack development. Uh, my pr primary interests are in software architecture, uh, user experience design and implementation, as well as software quality assurance. <clears throat> This talk will be divided into sections at the end of each section. Uh, apart from this first one, there will be time for a few questions. Um, there will be a lot of new concepts explained, so I really want to make sure that you're following along so uh, you don't get, get behind in the concepts. Um, first, there will be a bit of theory about the pattern, and then we'll go in straight into implementation examples step-by-step step, uh, presenting each of the concepts. <clears throat> uh, after explaining the concepts, I'll address some issues that this pattern might uh, present when used. So, Model View Presenter, it's a, a pattern for developing user interface. Um, and it provides a high degree of separation of concerns, if you're familiar with that terms. Um, and it's oriented about um, separating the concerns in the presenta presentation layer of applications. At the same time, it improves the testability of this layer in our applications. There's a lot of variations. It was uh, popular in the 90s and the start of the noughties, but this is my variation for, for Angular apps. Um, if you've never heard about Model View Presenter, uh, the short description is uh, written here. The model is basically in an Angular app presented by application state and some kind. It could be plain old services or NGRX store or something like that. The view is our components, uh, but in, when applying this pattern, we, we really want our components to be as thin a user interface as possible that presents the app state to user and translate the user interactions to component specific events while often delegating to a presenter which is the final element. The presenter is where we isolate complex uh, presentation logic um, and we do that to make it easy to test uh, as opposed to um, testing through end-to-end -end, uh, testing in the components. This is separation of concerns in an Angular application, or at least some examples of how you could uh, imagine it's divided into several layers, and we really only want one of our, uh, our classes to do one thing at a time, and one thing only of these, um, these, uh, uh, these different layers. You can think of it as compartmentalization of our apps. Uh, we separate the logic into system concerns to be able to focus on one thing at a time and test it well. At the topmost level, it's an architectural design um, discipline, but in day-to-day -day development, it is about knowing what goes where in our app. <clears throat> we can talk about vertical slicing, and horizontal slicing, or both, 
When slicing vertically, we group the software ar uh, artifacts by feature, like we used to in Angular. But when we slice horizontally, as here we are grouping the software into layers, layers of concerns. <clears throat> and we can even apply this principle to our Angular components, and that's the motivation for this talk. Uh, we should uh, be able to have components that fall into exactly one of these layers. Uh, in a nutshell, it's about don't make HTTP requests or connect to web sockets or access camera or other I.O. devices directly in your component. You'll have to abstract that out into one of the other layers. Just like if you've made backend development uh, with, say, ASP.NET, you wouldn't have SQL uh, queries in the controller. It's similar to that. Our components should only be concerned with the presentation and user interaction. Other layers are consumed and triggered through this app state management systems. This will result in a loose coupling uh, between the moving parts of our systems. And uh, don't be fooled, this process requires a lot of discipline. We are adding additional layers of abstract abstraction, but um, really we are only adding layers that should have been there in the first place. <clears throat> so, the end goal is an app that is highly maintainable. Um, instead of an increasing pile of technical debt, we are proactive as opposed to reactive when handling changes in our customer requirements. It's very difficult to achieve this level of agility with a system that is tightly coupled and hardly testable that takes months to refactor. When I talk about agility here, I talk about the cost of change, not about the agile process and ceremonies. <clears throat> a modular software architecture is what will enable us to move fast and be agile. Some will consider this an overly complex result of over-engineering, but in reality what we are left with are many uh, simple and modular pieces of software that connect well and in a predictable way. So even though it's composed of many different parts, parts, each part is very simple and only concerned with a single system concern from the previous categories. We'll have a clear system in place as to what goes where. Excuse me for a second. So we will minimize the the logic in the software artifacts that are difficult to test, and uh, that is everything that's Angular specific. Uh, each piece of software has exactly one system concern, and they're easy to reason about. These assumptions are easily verifiable in automated tests. <clears throat> this will be scalable because feature features can be developed in isolation from each other. Even the software in separate layers can be developed and tested in isolation. Uh, we are all aware of what exactly what goes where and where is this piece of logic is supposed to go. <clears throat> in general, the, a high degree of separation of concerns enable high performance, especially in the presentation layer. Performance bottlenecks are easily tracked and isolated. So, this, these are the, the parts that make up for the MVP pattern in Angular. Uh, some of you might have heard of container components, especially from the React community, but there's been a lot of interest uh, about it lately. Uh, several talks at uh, ng-conf and other conferences about Angular. Um, and, but I combine it with a few more uh, concepts to, to make up for the MVP pattern. <clears throat> While Angular is mostly about developing the presentation layer of our application, <clears throat> and it fits uh, nice in, into a unidirectional data flow, it's set up for ease of use instead of performance by default. It is up to us as developers to carefully design our UI components to support this unidirectional data flow. Um, 
So, container components has usually been mentioned uh, in connection with uh, using the NGIX store, but with this pattern it will be easy to use any app state management, even if it's just plain old services. The presentational component is made up of the view, which is declared in template, and a component model that has in input and output properties for data binding and regular properties for presentational logic. Complex presentational logic can then be delegated to the presenter if need be. All in all, uh, the app state, uh, which is accessed through container components, uh, will be the, the model in the MVP pattern. The presentational components will define our view. And finally, the presenters will handle UI behavior and complex presentational logic. I have uh, published a GitHub repository where I have converted uh, two of heroes using this pattern. And you can feel free to download it, maybe not do an NPM install, but take a look at the code uh, and take it home and, and play. It's a complete Angular 6 uh, application. So uh, now that we have defined the concepts, we'll move on to the implementation details. I assume, though, that you are somewhat familiar with the Two of Heroes uh, tutorial application for Angular. First, let's talk about container components. Container components are the integration layer between the UI and the app state. They supply the data for presentation and they translate component-specific events to app state commands and queries. So let's start out with a simple example to, um, to start this, this process of <coughs> extracting container components in Angular. Um, can any of you address some issues in this component from Two of Heroes? If you think about the separation of concerns, uh, which layers are this component uh, concerned about? Okay then, does it support the unpush change detection strategy? It, it will not, it will only work with the default change detection strategy as is. <clears throat> Why do we even need the uninit uh, lifecycle hook here? What's it for in this component? Well, it's... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's for initialization, uh, downloading the... by subscribing to this Get Heroes Observable, uh, the data will be loaded as soon as the component is initialized. But does this have anything to do with presentation in our application? No, it's about app, app state. That's what services are usually all about. What about the subscription? That's the result of subscribing to the observable. What happens to that? Philip says that it lives forever. Well, we don't know from looking at this code, but if it's an HTTP client call, it'll actually complete as soon as we subscribe, so we don't have to unsubscribe from the subscription. But we can't really tell from this example. So we would have to, to test it to make sure, or go into the hero service uh, API. OK, but now I'll try to uh, extract the app state logic out of this component and leave behind a presentational component. All the app state concerns will be extracted into a container component like this. So this comp container component model, it streams the data from the state management layer through RxJS observables. It's exactly uh, as it was before, but this container component will wrap the presentational component and supply it with this data. Uh, 
through its template, as we'll see in a second. <clears throat> and also, as you see here, are there any subscriptions to observables going on? There's not. Not yet, that is. So, this is the template of this container component. Um, and its template is made of, of the presentational component and we data bind onto it <clears throat> and using the async pipe Angular will handle the subscription and eventually the unsubscription of observables. <clears throat> so this is uh, making good use of the declarative syntax in ang Angular templates. Actually what, what this does is it creates some JavaScript that subscribes to the observables for us and set the properties on initialization of the uh, internal or the presentational component instance. And notice also that the lifecycle hook is completed, completely gone now because of the async pipe that handles this for us. Using this, <coughs> sorry, using this pattern, we rarely have to manage subscriptions ourselves in simple components. For, no, for, sorry, for now, this title property is static, but later on we can easily select any part of the app state for binding this title property, should we want to. So the state is extracted out from the, uh, the component we started out with, and um, we'll take a look in a second at what is left in that component. Are there any questions about these container components? All right, you'll have an another opportunity to ask later, but we'll move on to presentational components. <clears throat> Our presentational components in this pattern should be data in, events out. That's the reactive programming approach, and it's the unidirectional data flow that we really want in our apps to uh, keep them performant. Our component models in our presentational components should be the glue that connects its templates to its data binding API, that is the input and output properties, and really not much, much more than this, as we'll see in a second. <clears throat> so this is what is left, as opposed to four. I declare the presentational components data binding API, that's the input properties, that's the only data we need for presentation. Um, And you can see it matches the bindings that we had in the container components template that's at the bottom, bottom of this page. <clears throat> um, a slight change is that I, the component selector, I changed it to app dashboard UI <laughs> instead of app dashboard. You don't have to do this. It's just a quick way of not having to come up with clever names. Could be that the container component was called app dashboard container instead, or it could be Top Heroes dashboard, or even App Top Heroes dashboard, if you do not want to wrestle with TSLint about it. So, the next step is that we, <clears throat> we should use minimal presentational logic in the component template and component model. Um, and here's the template of the presentational uh, component. Um, Notice about this that there are absolutely no observables whatsoever. There are no subscriptions and there are no lifecycle hooks. There's one piece of uh, logic left that is the router link. The detail path should really be extracted out, but we'll leave it here for now and uh, postpone it to a later uh, stage in the project. Um, just to keep things simple. <clears throat> What about now? Does this presentational component uh, support the on-push change detection strategy? Any other than, than Philip that wants to take a guess? <laughs> yes, it does. Yes. Why? How come? Because you're no longer subscribing to anything. That's right. New ref object references and string references will be coming in through the input uh, properties. So we can mark this as um, one push change detection. <clears throat> 
like I just did. Uh, Unpush change detection strategy gives us performance by disabling some dirty checking change detection on our, on our components and its child components in the component tree. Uh, that's important, especially if we had a component instance per, say, table row or table cell in a data table. <clears throat> Just a second. However, uh, however, when we use this pattern and on push change detection, we have to be very careful to always use immutable data structures. TypeScript script gives us read-only and read-only array generic interfaces that can disable the mutation properties of an object or an array. There's also immutable JS and object freeze to uh, take care of this issue. And there's even some immutable TSLM rules you can use if you don't want additional uh, execution that immutable JS brings and object freeze. They're not that fast when used in scale. <coughs> but uh, you can also just assign the read-only type to your objects and read-only array to your arrays. If you're unfamiliar with uh, the concept of immutable uh, data structures, in short, it means that every time you want to assign a property or remove an item from an, an array, you clone that into a similar object and a similar array, but without the item you want to remove and with the property change that will produce a new object reference which will trigger the change uh, the rendering of our components even when using the unpush change detection strategy uh, what happens then is that angular just checks whether any of the references that are input properties has changed since its last run but it does not traverse the template or child components to dirty check every dynamic data or template binding that's present. Working with immutable data structures is actually uh, easy with the spread operator uh, that's part of ES6 and, and later on that, both for working with objects and arrays. So what we're left with here is a pure presentational and primarily stateless component that is, it takes some implicit state from its input properties. Other than that, it's free from external, external state dependencies. It will render the same, uh, given the same input properties, every single time. This gives us, us some great properties for testing and uh, verifying um, assumptions about the component. Even if we wish to, to mix in the, the DOM in our tests. Uh, it can even support snapshot testing with Jest uh, as opposed to, to Karma and Jest, Jasmine for presentational regression tests if we pref prefer that. And that is without stopping any dependencies uh, because it doesn't even take any dependency into its constructor now. It's a really nice piece of soft software at this point. <clears throat> Are there any questions about presentational components or the container components from before? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for, for someone like a beginner, if we were to refactor our code uh, into this, yes. what do you recommend? Should we start with smart components and then slowly refactor into this architecture? Or should we just force ourselves to just go with this from the start? You don't have to uh, become dogmatic about this approach. You don't have to use it every single time. But actually, when you apply this pattern, you will start to see this pattern emerge, emerge from the, your components at the point that it's necessary. And you'll start to think about components in a completely different way. So no, you don't have to do it all the time. Start out with whatever you like and uh, try this pattern. and all of a sudden you will start to apply it without even thinking thinking about it and think uh, things like well this why is this state here this is a presentational component I want it to potentially be reusable and uh, you could even make some 
uh, some fake container components during development if you don't have a backend yet or don't want to wait on the slow backend guys to complete it <laughs> and stuff like that uh, and also and also in tests if you want to integrate it with a container component I hope that somewhat answers it for now I'll go into more details about it just later and Philip when would you like in the loop that you have, when would you put a, a component inside the loop and when would you have the template like you have right there? Oh, okay. So in the ng4 loop, yeah. in the template, that's here. Well, um, but if that changed based on this pattern, or is that completely the same? Well, there are a lot of places in the two of heroes uh, uh, tutorial that could really need, need some more components because they are doing too much, many of them. They are mostly top-level components with a lot of uh, stuff going on. Um, but then again, there's not much going on. We don't have to make a hero component that goes into this ng4. And another issue with this that I will address later is so-called con uh, component tags of adding <coughs> custom elements all over the place every time we we want to have a new component. So let's get back to it at a later point. Any additional questions? All right. So we'll move on to an advanced example. This was pretty basic. And um, like before, we'll apply what we've learned so far. So what we want from the next component, uh, again, data in, events out, support the unit directions data flow. The component model should be not much more than the glue that connects its template to the input and output API. So does anyone have an idea what to do first to this component? Get straight out of the, straight out of the two of heroes uh, tutorial. Can you see anything wrong with it if we want to follow the pattern I described before? Yes? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, we need to get rid of the hero service. The hero service, yes. Why? Why do we need to get rid of it? Exactly. So the service should be extracted out. Um, it, yeah, it's really completely the, sa the same as before, even though this is a different component. The service is only there for supplying the initial data. Uh, how about the other methods that's there? What are they, their concerns? Are they presentational or do they belong in another of the, the layers in separation, separation of concerns? Philip? Sorry? Go ahead. What kind of logic? Presentational logic? No, it's business logic. Business logic. Philip? <laughs> yeah. They are about state management and persistence. So clearly, they don't belong in a presentational component as we have defined it. So, what we'll do is we make this into a container component. It's uh, really all of the stuff is <laughs> taken out from the presentational component and extracted into the container component. <clears throat> I have added a few private methods to keep the pessimistic update when adding and the optimistic update when deleting. That's the local app state uh, of this app. Uh, we should not be managing the app state in a container component, really, uh, because the state that we synchronize here is only local to this part of the con component tree. But it works because when we return to the dashboard, an HTTP request is sent out to get the server state that should be synced with this local app state. Um, but we, we can see from this that we, we should really move that server state to a persistent state in the app 
but that's a feature for another time since it will require some additions to the internals of the hero service. Alright, um, so let's move back and see what's left in the presentational component now that all of the stuff is gone. So I declare the presentational components data binding API, all the input and output properties it needs to, to trigger event and consume data. And actually there's a small piece of logic left here in the add hero method. Uh, which was separated out from from the things that were extracted into container component. And that's because this logic that's left is is it's about user interaction and um, some of it is even about validation. So it it still doesn't belong here but it definitely doesn't belong in the container component. <clears throat> Uh, the custom events in the event emitters are there to trigger the state management, uh, which will in turn persist the changes by de delegating to the persistence layer. But what was the next step after this one in building our presentational component? Does anyone remember? Well, uh, before it was uh, change detection on push, uh, but there's this step in between where we have to ensure that we only use the minimal amount of presentational logic in the component template and the component model. Uh, we don't want all that complex logic in uh, a software artifact that's hard to test and presentational components are usually hard to test because of all the extra angular uh, testing modules set up and tear down and it's quite slow actually. So if we look into the, the template at the bottom of the slide um, we see that there's actually also some remaining presentational logic there. It clears the hero name after adding a hero uh, we should really strive to have nothing more than property bindings and event bindings that delegate to event emitters or methods in the component model. But we will leave it for now and not worry about it at, at this point. Are there any more steps I, I haven't uh, performed yet on this presentational component? I mentioned it a few seconds ago and it's still not here. Yes? Exactly. We apply the unpush change detection strategy. And now we're done with this, uh, with applying the pattern to this component. Um, in the template, we see how we are allowed, uh, for me at least, it's fine to emit an event directly in the template. Uh, to remove the output property, uh, sorry, uh, emit an event to the remove uh, event emitter. There's no real complexity here, so this is okay. Uh, if we want it to be really strict or to ensure that we are always able to intercept the events in our presentational component model, we could make methods called remove hero, on remove, or on delete click to handle all the user interactions in the component model. Uh, I renamed the event to remove uh, because I found that the concept of deletion is really a state management concern and persistence concern, not a concern of the presentational logic, but you can call it whatever you found uh, most useful. So are there any questions about what I just did to this component? Um, there's one last piece that I'm missing, and that's the presenters. At this point, we should have extracted all the app state logic, and what we are left with is only local UI state. We can now encapsulate the complex presentational logic and presenters. That's the user interaction layer. Uh, 
And once we have performed this final step, we will have a very high degree of separation of concerns, and this will in turn allow us to discover patterns in our presentation logic that present some opportunities for reuse. We will be able to distinguish behavior from presentational logic, and this behavior sometimes belongs in Angular directives. So, this is the point we reached uh, before, um, and now we extract all of the complex presentational logic that's left in the presentational component. We do that by creating a hero's presenter and uh, extracting the method into that, and we make an observable uh, through a subject so that the presentational component can connect to this the stream of data and in turn connect that to its output event emitter. <clears throat> I'll not really be going into details of RxJS here, but this is a pretty basic example. The subject is similar to an event emitter, but event emitters are only meant to be used as component output properties. And instead of calling this add emit value, we call this add next value. Um, and then we add an, a public observable property that the presentational component can subscribe to. <clears throat> um, actually, the behavior that's here in the add hero method looks like it's validation logic, so it would be a good opportunity to introduce Angular reactive forms at this point, but I will uh, I'll not do that in this, this talk. It will be for a later time. So, to use this in the presentational component, we have to inject it into the presentational component. We do that by providing it in, in the component decorator, and we add it to the constructor. Uh, with a component provider, as opposed to the Angular module provider, it's available to this component and all its descendants in the component tree. Next step is that we connect the presenter to the presentational components data binding API. You can see that we now we actually introduce the on init hook because we have to subscribe to the presenter's observable and emit it through the event output. The add hero method is now delegated to presenter. Again, this is a very basic example, and it's you wouldn't think of doing that. Uh, this soon, maybe, but uh, in the GitHub repository, you will see some more complex examples, especially in the hero details uh, component. So the last step is actually we have to manage the subscription that we just introduced. And we do that by this pattern of making a destroy subject that's uh, emitted and completed in the undestroy lifecycle hook. Uh, you could also have uh, saved the uh, reference to the subscription in a property, but using this approach we can handle multiple subscriptions at once and not have to add additional properties later on. <clears throat> so, just quick, are there any questions about the presenters? Well, I'll move on then. Um, now that we have all these software artifacts that deal with a single system concern, they are easy to unit test. Um, I recommend adding Puppeteer as a development dependency to support headless Chrome and speed up our unit tests. All of these uh, additional components and uh, presenters are uh, provided with a test suite in the GitHub repository. When unit testing most uh, of our presentational components and their templates are hardly worth testing, which is nice because testing them and setting up the Angular testing module is tedious, it's error prone, and it's very slow. There's a, a way to circumvent the, this by reusing the testing module because what happens by default is that uh, at each single test case it will compile the templates of 
the components which can be located in other files. So first it will load one file and then the other. Have to compile it at each simple uh, test step or test case. Uh, our presenters are not naturally isolated as they have no dependencies at all. Uh, and the container components, they are also pretty easy to isolate, but uh, they still have, they usually have the service dependencies, which take some effort to stop, but at least they're not slow anymore. <clears throat> uh, because of this, we will rarely uh, have a need to use the Angular testing modules, so we will, we can keep having fast tests most of the time. Uh, an exception is that if we develop reusable uh, components that makes hard use of ng content and view content and other queries, uh, we will have to use the Angular testing module. So I will quickly move on. Uh, there's a few uh, concepts left, and uh, one of them is presenter injection. We can be really explicit, explicit about the component injector to prevent the pre presenter from leaking into child components. We can additionally explicitly ask for the presenter that's provided in the components injector. So how are we going to do this? Uh, well, it's done by switching at the top from provider to a view provider. The view provider will make sure that only uh, components in, in the presentational components uh, view is able to inject this zero presenter. And that's usually, uh, sometimes we want this. We want a single presenter to supply data for all, let's say it was table cells, and we want a presenter per table row or something like that. Then it will make sense that they have access to it. In re reusable components, it could also make sense that uh, this presenter is provided for content uh, components, content child components. In the constructor, I add the self decorator to make sure that it, it only gets the its own injector. Sorry. <clears throat> and now I'll address the issue of component taxes that. Uh, Justin Schwarzenberger talks about in Embrace Component Trank 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 Sorry, it's hard to say. Embrace Component Tranquility. Because when we use this additional container component, an extra DOM element is introduced to the component triad we have. This adds to the component tax as the bundle size, the execution time, and the rendering costs are increased. We could also get into situations where a certain DOM structure is expected, usually in the inside a table element or select element. In these cases, we would not even be able to introduce the additional component to the DOM. We could try an ng container. Uh, the ng container renders as a comment, but that's not supported by Angular components. They can only hook into a, an, an actual DOM element uh, or a node, not a comment DOM element. <clears throat> so here's one way of trying to get by this problem. Um, so this is the Hero Search container component template. But if we do not want the additional cost of the container com component custom element in the DOM, we will try to mirror this logic in a directive that don't have templates. Any ideas how to, to do this? Oh, that's fine. Um, in this experiment, I extended the Hero Search container component just to get its properties, and then I add some additional logic here. Um, in a real scenario, the, this directive would 
entirely replace the container component and implement its properties itself. <clears throat> but by using this approach, um, unfortunately, we lose the declarative syntax of data binding in Angular templates, so we have to assign properties and subscribe to observables ourselves. If you noticed before, in the template, Angular handles this for us with async pipe and the property bindings and event bindings. Now we have to do this in kind of a more imperative fashion. Uh, also, have I forgotten about anything here? If you take a look at what happens uh, with regards to observables. Exactly, there's subscription here. I've forgotten about that. So let's just add some logic. Again, the destroy subject pattern. And this time it actually handles multiple subscriptions. So I just pipe in with the take until operator into the destroy subject. And Angular will take care of uh, canceling this subscription for us. Um, yes? Yeah, the, the, the exactly. Sure. That's right. That'll but also work. Yeah, just because I like RxJS, this yeah. is a more <laughs> reactive approach to it, more uh, as opposed to the imperative assigning of properties that makes for a mutable state. But yes, you're right. You could have just uh, make a uh, destroy boolean and using the take while or take until uh, oh, sorry, the take while operator. Right. So this is what it looks like when we add this directive. Uh, before we had the app hero search by itself, uh, but now the app hero search container component is gone, and we're left with the presentational component. And on that, we add the, this uh, container directive that we just implemented. Um, but I think that there's a problem in this. Uh, before, we had this nice declarative syntax, and now there's just a single directive, and we have no idea what's actually going on. And we had to implement all that uh, logic ourselves and subscribe, and manage subscriptions, uh, assign properties. So, but we saved the DOM elements, unfortunately. We got rid of it, the container component elements. <clears throat> but how can we improve upon this? Um, I'll now introduce uh, the last concept that's a provider directive. Before I had a container directive, this is a provider directive, and I named it that way because it's inspired by provider components in React Redux. Just like with the container components, we extract all the inspiration from the presentation component, but this time into a provider directive model. But these are exactly the same methods and properties that we had, as we had in the container component, but without the lifecycle hooks and the subscription management. <clears throat> um, so at the bottom here you can see how I connect this provider directive to the presentational uh, component. Now I'm able to do this in a declarative way and it's very similar to what we had before but this time uh, this uh, markup is part of the, the parent uh, component, which is the dashboard in this case. And there is no container component, and there is no container component element anymore. Um, still have the presentational uh, component element though, but it could be applied to a native element or a third-party custom element if we really wanted to get rid of 
the extra DOM elements and uh, get some component tax cuts. So um, the role of the provider directive is that it, like the container component, it connects the presentational component to the app state, state layer and behind the app state layers are persistence and business logic layers usually. Uh, are there any questions about the component tax cuts, these uh, provider directives and container directives? So right, uh, there's a more complex example at the GitHub repository. I suggest you take a look at it. It's in the hero details component. I also applied the pattern to this one and it's a bit more difficult because it has observables with both with, with concerns that are cross-cutting. So it's both uh, user interface logic mixed with persistence and app state logic. So I just you take a look at that when you get home. But instead I will skip to the closing remarks. Um, I definitely recommend adding hot module replacement to a development environment, not just for this process, but for all your Angular app development. It's not really that hard to configure. You can see an example how in this repository. Um, this was one of the big things uh, that Webpack introduced, so I, I have yet to figure out why it's not enabled by default in the Angular CLI, because it supports it. Uh, you just have to add a few files and add an additional flag. <clears throat> so, as I talked a bit about uh, earlier on, don't get dogmatic about this pattern. It is only a pattern. It is not a written law. You do not necessarily need a com container component or presenter for every single component. You can leave them as is until they start becoming complex. And then you can use this pattern to make it more simple and divide it into additional software artifacts. I left out uh, Angular Forms from this talk as I'm still figuring out where it's sits best in this pattern. Uh, for this reason I left the template driven form in the hero search component alone even though it is neither reactive nor immutable and it definitely doesn't belong in the template. So just to sum things up um, presentational components can share a container or even a presenter. Uh, again can imagine a set of presentational table components that has presentational row and cell components in its view uh, or its content uh, nested uh, in the ng content area. All of these presentational components can share a single presenter or even a single container component uh, that integrates the presentational table to the app state. Uh, uh, presentational components can then bind events and properties to its child components. So we don't have to have a container component for every single presentational component. We are still allowed, if we want to, to uh, just bubble events up through the component tree if we think that's easier, and bind the properties down in the component tree as well. But if you work with this pattern, uh, Presentational components makes you think carefully about what state to externalize and what to keep internal to component. This will result in apps that are that have reusable and highly composable components. We can use fake container components during development um, to speed up development in general and not have to deal with those pesky backend developers. So, just to Close up, I'd like to make some attributions. Uh, Jason Bonsa works at Facebook. Uh, he described container components uh, in a React talk. Uh, Michael Chen Tastic Chan uh, also described uh, container components in an article. And Dan Abramov uh, made a, a hugely popular article about it. And that's where I learned from it originally. <clears throat> Dan Abramov also had has the uh, an egghead series on Redux um, where he teaches about the provider components that uh, inspired the 
provider directives. Also, I'd like to give credit to Dave M. Bush from Bloomberg. Um, he introduced the idea of model view presenter with Angular, and I built upon that and tried to figure out how I would do it. Um, Roy Pellet from Cyber Reason uh, had an article about model view presenter for JavaScript in general, and I also took uh, some inspiration from that. Uh, Swarty from Narwhal um, had, has this talk called Embrace Component Tranquility. It's about component taxes, and go watch that, and you will get a deeper understanding of why we want to get rid of the additional DOM elements. So, that's it from me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the organizers for hosting this event. Thank you to the sponsors. And I'll take a few final questions if you have some. Uh, do you use this architecture in your day to day life right now? Like I was? And what is the size of the system? If yes. If I teach architecture? No, no, if you use it. If I use this, yeah. I have developed uh, some hobby apps with this pattern and improved upon it. But now I think it's at a stage where I could start applying it to real environments. So no, I haven't used it yet in production. Yeah. Have those you mentioned done so? The React community has been using container components for years now, so we really need to catch up in Angular land. And the provider components are part of the React Redux library that's popular with Redux and uh, React. So I really hope you try this out and uh, contact me with if you have some ideas for improvements. Uh, make a pull request to a repository, and um, yes, I'd like to discuss this further with any of you that had, has interest in it. All right, that's it.